On the buzz meter this Sunday, as the press pans Donald Trump's transition as a chaotic mess, Kellyanne Conway weighs in on the coverage of the president-elect and why the journalist she deals with totally misjudged the election. Incontrovertibly, unequivocally, and empirically provable. If you just, if you quantified the analyses that were performed before the election, you will quickly see story after story, the path is narrow, the path is over, there is no 270. The media, meanwhile, ratcheting up their criticism of the president-elect. Sources tell CNN there's infighting and chaos and the Trump insiders didn't care about the transition because no one thought they were going to win. We too. The media is already talking about disarray. Everything's going to hell. It, like it's not even, it's not even a month. The start of the Trump administration is wobblier and weirder than I think anyone expected or imagined. And outraged that Trump ditched his press pool to take his wife to dinner. With new appointments now for Attorney General and National Security Advisor, are news organizations giving Trump and his team a fair shot? Megyn Kelly on coping with some tough personal and professional challenges, including her long and bitter battle with Donald Trump. He told me I was a disgrace and that I ought to be ashamed of myself. And then he told me I almost unleashed my beautiful Twitter account against you, and I still may. Plus, how on earth did fake news get so popular? I'm Howard Kurtz, and this is Media Buzz. Kellyanne Conway has become the face of the Trump transition. I sat down with Donald Trump's former campaign manager in New York. Kellyanne Conway, welcome. Thank you, Howie. Three column headline in the New York Times the other day. Firings and discord put Trump transition team in a state of disarray. What do you make of all the negative coverage surrounding the transition? Well, it's disappointing because it's also inaccurate. I'm in the transition meetings every day and with President-elect Trump, Vice President-elect Pence, things are going very well. And they're going well from a couple of perspectives. One, how does the President-elect transition from his role as candidate to eventually becoming president in about two months. Number two, how is the transition faring in terms of having these landing teams on each of the issue sets and within each of the departments and agencies? And are we wait, prepared? Wait, are we wait, vetting wait, wait. people? The press wants to know why he hasn't picked the cabinet yesterday. Well, the answer is it's a very serious task, yeah. A. B, we're right on time, right on target for what's been done in the past, Republican and Democratic alike. And how we, I would just remind us all, 16 years ago, after the 2000 election, you and I recall, we didn't know who the president was until about December 12th. So everybody went to Thanksgiving that year, not even knowing who the president would be, let alone who his cabinet would be formed of. So I think everybody should just relax. And for me, it's just, it's been an extension with the media, an extension of all the negativity and inaccuracies and the conclusions in search of evidence that truly define the campaign season. Well, since you brought that up, do you feel that, especially in the general election, now continuing in this transition period, that the press, much of the press, I should say, has held Donald Trump to a more negative, harsher, different standard than other presidential candidates. Incontrovertibly, unequivocally, and empirically provable. If you just, if you quantified the analyses that were performed before the election, you will quickly see story after story, the path is narrow, the path is over, there is no 270, Donald Trump will destroy the entire Republican Party, take all the down ballot candidates with him into and the when abyss. when you went on all those shows in the closing weeks and said he has a path, he could win this election, you were kind of dismissed as offering a lame kind of spin. It was, it was a combination of, we love Kellyanne, but she's full of it. Or, <laughs> she works really hard, but the path is over, the race is yeah. over. And, you know, Howie, the open question is, so what will come of that? You know, will will many people in the media start stop listening to each other and start listening to Americans? Because in my view, the cues and the clues of this election result were in front of everyone the whole time. They were hiding in plain sight. If you went to Why Donald Why couldn't Trump's journalists hear them? You're saying there's a, there's a bubble, there's an echo chamber? Well, fundamentally speaking, one would think on paper that Hillary Clinton would have the best chance of being elected mm -hmm. president. And for a while, I think that's true if you just looked at the fundamentals. Sure. Who would raise the most money? Who's hired the most staff? Who's best known in the country? Who has that, quote, D.C. resume filled of accomplishments that would qualify um, her? I think Jim Rutenberg from The New York Times put it best, and a few others like him, The Washington Post and other places, where these journalists literally admitted that Donald Trump compelled them to suspend 
objective standards of basic journalism, that their mandate was stop him at all costs. And so you see people orienting their reporting, orienting their polling questions that way. I have written that. Though some of these journalists would say, well, we weren't trying to stop him. We were trying to fully vet him and investigate him. But look, Donald Trump has fired back. He tweeted several times at the, quote, failing New York Times this week, saying the paper looks foolish. But he told Leslie Stahl he was going to be restrained on Twitter and if he used it at all. So is this going to remain a weapon of his against the media? It certainly is a tool of communication for him that's very effective. I mean, Donald Trump has uh, 25 million plus followers on Facebook and Twitter combined. And what I used to tell him during the campaign too, Howie, is that it's such a powerful exit for him. In other words, a mode of communicating that but for him posting an event or, or a rally he was going to have or an article that talked about the strength he may have in western Pennsylvania, for example, or among union households or, or the rural vote, mm -hmm. then but for him posting that, there may be 25 million people who had not been exposed to that. So I still think it's a powerful tool for communications, but who can blame him if he's at all frustrated with not getting a fair shake? And the irony for me is that because the media did not equip America for the result that we have President Donald Trump, you have many people who can't seem to accept the election results. I think that's the greatest irony of the last few weeks is that it, it, everybody asks people like me, ask Donald Trump himself, will you accept the results right, of the election? Right, that was the question, third will debate. You? It was the right question, asked of the wrong, que uh, right. asked of the wrong candidate. Let me move to this. Orders. There was a huge flap over Trump uh, ditching his press pool and going out to dinner at the 21 Club with his wife. Uh, overblown a bit in my view, but there's an important issue here. Does Donald Trump understand the importance of having a protective press pool follow the next leader of the free world. Yes and yes, it was overblown. He has a right to go to dinner with his wife and his family. And and secondly, uh, yes, there is it is important to have a protective pool. Our communications director of transition, Jason Miller, did say after the 21 dinner that they'll do a better job of informing the press. But so it's a you're great committing. Example. He is committing to allowing a pool to be there just in case something unfortunate happens? Well, he's committing to, we're working out everything in transition, but he's committing to having the press do what it needs to do and be where it needs to be to cover him properly. But let me make very clear something that's important. When, when um, Barack and Michelle Obama slipped out once or twice for date mm -hmm. night, I think the president went to take a walk sometime. I don't remember the exact circumstances, but it literally was heralded as he's in touch with the common man. Look how great they are going to date night. It, again, it just shows you the, dis the disparate coverage of two different men trying to do the same thing, which is spend a little family time. Yeah, you're seeing a double standard here. In the closing weeks of the campaign, you were interviewed by MSNBC News anchor Stephanie Rule, and she said to you, how do you face your children working for Donald Trump? What did you think at the time? I was offended, to be honest with you. It wasn't the first time I heard that question, and I certainly get it a lot on Twitter, usually by people who have cats as their <laughs> picture. But anyway... But for journalists to say, basically, how do you live with yourself working for the guy, who now, by the way, is the president-elect? You know, no, States. no, that, that's exactly right. First of all, I live with myself by setting a great example for my children that if you work hard and one day get your opportunity, great things could happen. If you don't whine, you don't complain, if you focus and you become impervious to the naysayers and critics, you can actually accomplish the task at hand. But I thought that Stephanie's question was, it was most symptomatic of the following, which is the media insisted to the American people, here's what's important to you as you go into the ballot box. This is what you care about. This is what you'll vote on. And they became of one mind in that it was going to be exactly what Hillary Clinton was saying on the stump, what anchors, what, what mainstream journalists were saying in print and on TV and what Hillary Clinton's paid advertisement was about. She ended up talking about Donald Trump and women to the very last moment and or what he had said about someone 25 years earlier and America re rebelled. They said, you are not going to tell me what's important to me. So I, I always find the thought police and those who pretend they're for freedom of thought and you know, personal liberty are full of it when it comes to here's how you should raise your children, here's what you should discuss with them. Um, nobody's going to come between me and the way I decide to raise my children and what I discuss with them, but I can tell you they're very proud and like other people, particularly women uh, in, in politics, children, they've made enormous sacrifices for their mother to do this. There's a lot of resentment toward the press over this election, to put it mildly. Kellyanne Conway, thanks very much Thank for Thank you, Hallie. Appreciate it.
And joining us now to analyze the coverage of the presidential transition, Aaron McPike, a political commentator and former reporter for Real Clear Politics. Kelly Riddell, deputy opinion editor of The Washington Times. And Joe Trippi, Democratic strategist and a Fox News contributor. Aaron, you heard Kellyanne Conway say that in her view, she contends the coverage of the Trump transition has been too negative, but has it been unfair? It's hard to say. I think it may be a little bit unfair. Yesterday, at the beginning of Michael Smirconish's sh show on CNN, he said that my glass is now half empty, which I thought was unfortunate because we were just a week and a half into the transition, and the people voted for change, and it's important for even the press to keep an open mind. The transition has been a bit messy, Kelly, uh, with uh, Mike Pence replacing Chris Christie, former Congressman Mike Rogers was, was fired, but all transitions are somewhat messy, so do you see a different press standard here? Yes, I definitely do. I think that the press is try seeks out stories to confirm their own bias, and that is that Trump's presidency is going to be messy, so we've got to convey this chaotic story. The truth of the matter is, like President Obama didn't name, he didn't name a cabinet member for the first 14 days of his presidency, and David Axelrod even tweeted out this week that, you know, I don't remember anyone giving us grief for not, for not naming our, ca our cabinet members this quickly. So yeah, Axelrod said he thought it was an unfair shot yes. to say, why haven't there been more appointments? Exactly, and I think it's been totally unfair. But when Trump goes on Twitter, Joe, and attacks the New York Times and says things are going smoothly, well, not that smoothly. Well, no, but I, I agree with Kelly and David Axelrod and a lot of other people. I think they're, look, it, the coverage has been negative. I think the unfair part is uh, transition in disarray. Uh, that was it, a three-column headline in the New York Times, right, and you I, I agree. Just, this is like seven, yeah. and, uh, seven or eight days after uh, he's become the president-elect. So what and explains people are complaining. that? What explains that media mindset that I it's think, too slow, it's too chaotic, uh, he barely knows what he's doing? No, I think, I think that's driven by the narrative that was created during the campaign uh, uh, and the American people. Uh, by all polling, buying into to this argument that he wasn't fit, he wasn't ready, he's not qualified. No, no, what I'm saying is, so now you carry that narrative forward. It, what I think the Trump campaign didn't understand was that that anything they did, like disrupt, like changing transition yeah. shares, was going to play into that narrative. I don't. I do think it was unfair. I think the legitimate questions about who is he talking to. Oh sure, uh, yeah. who, what who is this there? Exactly? But let me let me come back to Aaron. It, it kind of feels like the election is still going on, and that many elements of the press are still sort of on a war footing, perhaps even in opposition to Donald Trump. Yeah, well, I think you're seeing a lot of editorializing go on by the mainstream media in terms of the picks that he, he makes. As best I can tell, for every name that gets floated that's a far-right conservative choice, there's also an establishment choice. And I think that could be politically shrewd, but that's not how the press is covering it. Well, I mean, look, uh, Donald Trump is talking to people like Mitt Romney, who trashed him during the campaign. Just brief answer here. Kellyanne Conway said in that interview that many people can't seem to accept the election results. Mm -hmm. Do you, Kelly, think that that includes some news organizations. I absolutely think that includes some new news organizations. That's why you see on the front page of the New York Times today a story about a, a school in Iowa they profiled and how in disarray it is because of this election or how people can't go home on Thanksgiving and have a civil discord with each other. On the front page, it's fueling that narrative. Right. There's this whole sort of what do we tell the children. Yes. I've never seen after any other presidential no. transition. Meanwhile, Kellyanne Conway becoming so famous that she popped up or someone portraying her popped up on Saturday Night Live. Take a quick look. Kelly, can I say something? I just want to thank you for all you've done. I wouldn't be president without you. I think about that every day. <laughs> Kate McKinnon switching from her Hillary role. All right, let us know what you think. Stick to the media. Media buzz at foxnews.com. When we come back, Donald Trump slips out for dinner and sparks a huge controversy by ditching his press pool. And later, how can Facebook stop the spread of fake news stories?